Millwood, uh, Micah here. I just wanted to tell you about something that I've been up to this week. Um, we have 15 volunteer youth leaders, and among them are a teacher, a small business owner, a mother of four uh, college students who are entering finals week uh, this coming week at Whitworth, and they are so foundational to what um, we do with students in um, the Millwood community. And it's not just me or Brandon, um, it's, it's our whole teams of leaders who are um, in the lives of students and giving them opportunities to grow. And so this week I made care packages for each of them and delivered them around to the ones um, who are local and mailed the ones um, to a few of our college students who are home with their families right now. Um, but that was really fun just to get to drop those off, interact a little bit um, from a social distance and just get to thank our leaders for what they do because they are so, so important um, to our ability to really care uh, for kids. Um, and as usual, the things that we're doing with students are on Zoom and the details are on our website under the youth tab. And so you're more than welcome to check that out uh, if you'd like. And so I just want to thank you guys again um, for all the ways that you are supportive and encouraging um, during this time. And I would just invite you to pray for kids, pray for students, because this time is dragging on um, and it's getting a little bit more tiring and emotionally exhausting, I think, than some might have realized. And so I just ask that with us, would you pray for kids who really need a little bit more joy and love and light in their life right now? Thank you, guys. Well, good morning, Millwood Community Church. It is good to be together this morning. Thank you for joining us as we, as we come together again for the sake of worshiping God, for lifting up our prayers, lifting up our praises, hearing from God as we come together. I want to just continue to thank you for your endurance and your patience as we try these new ways of worshiping, doing these things online. Some of you have joined our, our Zoom watch party to, to be together in worship. Some of you are more comfortable uh, watching it on your own. All of that is, is, is really great, you guys. I'm just really thankful uh, that the spirit of this congregation is showing through and that we're, we're looking for and finding ways to, to be the church in this very, very strange season. Uh, like all of you, I've been watching the news and trying to trying to take it in in, 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 in bite-sized chunks. There's so much information that, that, that is out there and of course uh, trying to figure out what to what to look at and listen to and what to believe and it's it's a dizzying and exhausting process. I know many of you are, are, are weary of all of that. We just want to know something solid, something firm that we can put our hope in to say, okay, it's going to happen here, and this is what we can do, and this is when it'll happen, and, and that's just not our reality right now. I know many of you, many, I, I include myself, want to know when are we going to be able to be back together in worship, and, and the only real answer that, that I can give you is we just don't know right now. Um, our presbytery, our leadership, we're all going to be looking for ways to, to reopen in, in safe ways and ways that allow us to, uh, to come together. But it's just going to take time to get all of that, all of that in place. And so uh, thank you for your, your patience with it. Uh, I know that this has been a, a really long process, and, and I just, again, am thankful for the support and encouragement that you've shown uh, each other as we move through this time. Uh, I can tell you that no matter what happens, we will continue to be a, a church community, and in the end, we will be a, a stronger community because we've been through this, we've been through this together. Well, speaking of things that we are doing together, I remind you that last week uh, our friend Shelly Fetcho came and introduced us to a, an opportunity that we have, an all-church art project, uh, and we have been sending out supplies to people all over town. Uh, we've actually received our first entries, our first uh, our first entries for that installation. Uh, this is these are the the the, the entries from the Schultz family and. That's from Heather, you can see that there. And here's what David was, David came up with. And we've got Jacob right here. I'm actually not entirely sure which way it's supposed to go. There's Jacob's 
whoops, and there's um, Hannah Schultz's. So thank you to the Schultz family for being our, our first group to get your art entry back in, but uh, certainly not the last. Friends, I really wanna encourage you to be a part of this. This is something that really anybody can, can do. And so if you haven't signed up to be a part, then you're gonna wanna uh, send an email to Shelly Fecho at the email there, or you can give her a call and we'll make sure that you get, uh, you get what you need so that you can be a part of this project. Really do, again, wanna encourage everyone um, to be a part of it. This is something that hopefully, that hopefully we can hang on to for a long, long time. And we wanna make sure that you are included in it. Our last announcement before we begin worship is just, it's not really an announcement, but it's simply uh, an acknowledgement that today is, is Mother's Day. And so we wanna say happy Mother's Day to all of you who are celebrating. Hope you are finding ways to celebrate mom today in this strange season. Probably not taking her out for lunch or dinner, but maybe, uh, maybe you're making her lunch or dinner. Hopefully you're treating her really well. Um, Mother's Day, of course, is a is a is a is a tricky day in some ways, and, and for for many people, it's a a day of celebration. For for many people, it's a hard day, frankly. Uh, some have not had the opportunity to be moms, and that is a that is a hard reality. Uh, for some, Mother's Day is a reminder of a broken relationship. Not all mother mother child relationships are are in great places and so there might be a an edge to this day for for some of us so as we worship uh, we will give thanks for moms but we'll also lament uh, some of those harder realities and we'll do that particularly during our prayer time so friends with that i want to invite you to take a moment to settle your hearts and minds uh, Hannah Schultz, as it turns out, is, our, is going to be our worship leader, and so she will come and call us to worship. Good morning. My name is Hannah Schultz, and I would like to call us to worship. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? and who shall stand in his holy peace. Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully.
Mother's Day to all of the mothers and grandmothers. Today I wanted to talk to the kids about the fruits of the spirit some more and today I'm talking about joy and what a perfect day to talk about joy on Mother's Day. As a mom I know the day I became a mother the blessing that I was giving and what joy was brought into my life. There is a big difference between happiness and joyfulness. Happy can be in a situation. I'm happy that we are together. I'm happy that none of us are ill. I'm happy that it's very situational. Joy Joy is much deeper than that. It comes from a blessing from God, like becoming a mother. What joy was put into my life. So I want to share a verse in the Bible with you. This is in Proverbs 23, 25, and it reads, So give your father and your mother joy. May she who gave you birth be happy. She deserves to be happy. She deserves that joy. But another thing that I want you to think about is that not only are you a joy to your mother, but your mother is a joy for you. God gave us mothers. She takes care of us. She loves us unconditionally. She does so much for us. And that's what today is really all about, is to celebrate our mother and the joy that she brings to us. So today, I would like to do a fun little project with you. It's as easy as drawing your hand. On each finger, we make a little flower. So this becomes your flower bouquet. And on each flower, write down something you love about your mother. It may be, I love her hair. I love her laugh. I love her singing. I love her cooking. I love her hugs or kisses. Whatever you love about your mother, what a joy that would be to receive that bouquet of flowers from her child for Mother's Day. Okay, so here is what mine looks like. So you notice that I cut out my hand and then I cut flowers out to match onto my each finger. So on this side, I have all of the different I've got all these flowers here. All of the different reasons I love my mother. I put Happy Mother's Day on it and what I love about my mom. So that would be a nice little gift for her. So I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. And I hope that you remember our verse, Proverbs 23, 25. So give your father and mother joy. May she who gave you birth be happy. God loves you, so let's just pray. Father God, thank you so much for giving us the gift of mothers and grandmothers. Lord, you knew exactly what you were doing when you gave us a mother. And you also knew exactly what you were doing when you blessed a mother with her children. We praise you and love you and thank you for all of your great blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to pray the prayer of confession with me. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness and our shortcomings and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned. 
in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Now silent confession. Amen. Hear the assurance of forgiveness from John 3, 16, 17. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order for the world might be saved through him. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
And so at this time, I want to invite you to join me as we go to God together in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we do thank you for the gift of this day, for the life that you have breathed into each one of us, the day that you have set before. Lord, we thank you for the week that has passed us now that we have been through. Thank you for the ways that you've shown yourself to us, the ways that you have called us into deeper relationships with you and with others. Pray that the blessings that we have experienced will en enliven us to continue to live boldly through the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus that we have experienced and desire to extend to others. Lord, on this day, this Mother's Day, we do give you thanks for the moms in our congregation, for the people who have been mothers to each of us, for women in our lives who have helped us to become the people, more the people you've created us to be. We thank you. We ask your blessing on those people and ask that you would help us to, to honor them, to be thankful for them, to help us to show them our appreciation and our love. And Lord, we also acknowledge that Mother's Day for many brings a, a, an edge to it, a, a sense of, uh, of disappointment or of pain even. We do acknowledge and, 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 and pray for those in our midst and those that we know for whom uh, the idea of motherhood is, is, is not a joyful thing. 
whether it be for them personally, perhaps for those who desire to be parents, desire to be moms, but have not been able to. Also for those for whom the relationship that they have with their, with their own moms is not, not, not in a good place, is broken for whatever reason. And we do pray that in those situations that you would be a God of healing and peace and restoration as we lift them up to you on this day. Lord, as we consider the, the world around us, the long uh, season of quarantine, the continuation into the future, which is highly unknown, the, the phases that are before us, stages of, of re-entry, and, and we wonder how long those will be and what the steps will, will look like. We pray that you would, would be with us as we continue on. We pray that you would continue to look over those who are most vulnerable to the pandemic itself. Pray that you would be working in ways of healing for those who, uh, who have been afflicted with the virus. Lord, we think of the many, many people in our congregation, in our, in our area, friends, family, community members, neighbors who have been so deeply impacted by the, the, the quarantine itself, the economic, uh, the economic collapse that, that we've all seen, the, 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 the terrifying job loss numbers that were released the other day, the uncertainty of the future. We pray for those who are, are without employment, whose futures are terribly uncertain, for those who own businesses and have seen such drop off in their work. And we pray that in these situations that you would be a sustaining God, finding ways for each of them to move forward. And Lord, we would boldly pray that in all of these things that you would, that you would work in a powerful, miraculous way and bring an end to this pandemic. Lord, we pray that. We boldly pray. And so, friends, I want to invite you now to take a moment to lift up your own prayers to God. Lord, would you hear all of these spoken and unspoken prayers of your people? We pray all of this in the saving and strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ and pray together as he taught us, saying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen
And so at this time, we will uh, receive our tithes and offerings. Obviously, we can't do that in person, uh, but you are always welcome to give by sending a check to the church through the mail. Uh, our website has a portal that will allow uh, donations, and also we have a texting method that you can use. So friends, let us consider how we might give back to the work that God is doing here in Millwood and around the world. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 123, verses 1 through 4. To you I lift up my eyes, or, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of the maid. To the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. Well, as we go to scripture this morning, please join me in a word of prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you desire to speak to us. And so, Lord, help us to hear you. As we consider your scripture this morning, Father God, open our eyes that we might see you. Holy Spirit, open our ears that we might hear your voice. And Jesus, open our hearts that we might receive these words written so many years ago and yet intended for us on this very day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several years ago... Uh, when I was a pastor in Juneau, Alaska, uh, I got to be a part of a Bible study of a, a group of men all in their 40s. Uh, to a person, we all had good jobs. We had good families, good children. We were doctors, an engineer, a firefighter, a, a state trooper, a dentist, a freelance political consultant, a stay-at-home father. Uh, you'd love these guys. They were all great guys, every single one of them. And yet, I remember one day where we all, every one of us, acknowledged that from time to time in our lives, lives that seemed to be pretty good, we sensed a disconnect, a dissonance between 
the lives we led and how they were connected to the bigger world. Yes, we were working hard, we were working long hours, we were making sacrifices, we were doing the things that we were supposed to do. Generally, we all enjoyed our work quite a bit, but in the bigger picture, we wrestled with the question, do our lives really matter? Is there a purpose to the day in and day out routines that we were a part of? Are our jobs, our vocations, simply a way to earn our living, earn our keep, or was there more to it? You see, there's this longing in our hearts to belong to something deeper and richer than the repetitious tasks of everyday life. And this longing drives us to to be connected to, to a bigger narrative of the world around us. Something that that connects all of these things and makes sense of them. And so when we, we come to the scriptures of our Bible and passages like these parables of Jesus that we have been looking at for these past weeks, we long to see a connection made. We long to see how our lives are connected to the grand narrative of God's work in the world. Jesus wants us to see that. But to see it, our minds and our imaginations are going to have to get working. Jesus doesn't give it to us straight, as we've said a few times. Jesus makes us think. He makes us work for the answers. And so when we come to a parable like the one that we have today, we have to remember that this is not simply a a cute story about some fairy tale idealism. A parable actually gives us a glimpse as to how God sees the world. And that's what we want. We want to see the world the way God sees it. But there's a warning. There's a warning. If we do, if we do see the world the way God sees sees it, then we are going to be changed Seeing the world the way God sees the world will change us. And so, as I want to invite now Hannah to come read, Uh, she's going to be reading from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Hannah, please come read for us. Our New Testament scripture comes from Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted scrumptiously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. And now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this parable is a parable about how we see the world. There's a hard edge to this story, but there's also an invitation in this story. And it's an invitation to to see things as God sees them. Now, the parable has two characters, and and the details matter in this story. One character is rich, 
one character is poor. The poor character has a name, Lazarus. The rich character has no other identity. Both characters live near each other, and they both die near each other. But upon their death, we see uh, different ends. Lazarus was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham, and the rich man was buried in the ground. And the key to the story is the reversal that happens upon their death. You see, in his life, Lazarus hung out with the dogs. That's what the text says. And, and we love our dogs, but in that day, dogs were despicable creatures. They lived in the dumps. And if you're hanging out with the, the, if you're hanging out with the dogs, then you're an outsider. You are on the fringe. You are, you are a, a cast out. But after death, what we see is that Lazarus is sitting with Abraham. So that's Lazarus. On the other hand, the rich man, he, he dies, and his story picks up in the, in the realm of Hades. Maybe you remember your Greek mythology from, from high school or college. Uh, Hades was the brother of Zeus and Poseidon. After their father Kronos died, the three of them drew lots for their share of the universe. Poseidon got the sea, Zeus got the sky, and Hades was given the underworld, the place of the dead. And so this is now where the rich man resides, in the realm of Hades, in torment. Remember, in, in their lives, these two men lived very near each other. But in death, they're separated. A great chasm exists. And what Jesus is doing, probably more than trying to give us a glimpse of the afterlife, what Jesus is doing is helping us to see things the way God sees them. You know, there, there are many situations, there are many people that, that we interact with in our lives where we look at them, but we don't actually see them. And certainly, we don't always see them the way God does. Uh, this is a, a picture of a man named Luke. Someday I'll tell you more about Luke. He passed away uh, several years ago. But for now, I would just say that, that Luke was a guy that the first time I ever interacted, the first few times I interacted with him, uh, it was on the street. It was out near where we lived in Seattle. And frankly, my inclination was to try to ignore Luke. Uh, my reasons were pretty shallow, frankly. But then something happened. I began to participate in a, in a weekly community meal that, that our church was putting on for anybody to come to. And Luke was there most of the time. And so, uh, as it turned out, I sat next to him a few times. We got to know each other. Turned out that in his younger days, Luke was preparing to become a priest in the Catholic Church. And then one, one, one season, his mind sort of betrayed him. He had an episode of mental illness that, that haunted him until the end of his life. He ended up on the street. He, he lost his family. Luke had a terrible temper and had a hard time making friends. And yet, as I got to know him, I found out that he had a, a deep love for Jesus. And Luke loved Theology. He loved theology. He probably knew more theological, theological treatises and had a deeper understanding than, than I probably ever will. And Luke actually, in the course of our meals together, became one of the more powerful voices in my life. He was one of the first people that encouraged me to consider going to seminary and becoming a pastor. And I never would have gotten that experience, had that opportunity to, to hear from God through Luke if I hadn't had the chance to see him more deeply. You see, I had looked at Luke many times before I actually ever really saw him. Well, surely in his life, the, the rich man looked at Lazarus, but I don't think he ever saw him. Certainly not as God saw him. 
And because the rich man never really saw Lazarus, he never saw the opportunity for himself to, to use his life and his riches for something of deeper value. So with nothing better to think of, the, the rich man spent his money on things like purple cloth, clothing and, and linen, things that sparkle and, and feel good, but don't have any real lasting value. And so now, buried in his riches, he is unable to participate in the great comfort that Lazarus now knows. Fact is, he still sees Lazarus as beneath him. It's interesting, two times he calls for Father Abraham to send Lazarus to go fetch him some water, go fetch his brothers. You see, he still sees Lazarus as a servant to be used, not someone to be in relationship with it, to be with to be in with relationship. You see, this this rich man has a vision problem. He has a vision problem both in regards to his wealth and to his neighbor. He sees both of these things, his wealth, his neighbor, as instruments of his own comfort. Lazarus and his real, the reality of Lazarus was an offense to his comfort. And so he left him outside the wall. Stay, stay there, Lazarus. I don't want to see you. I don't want to acknowledge your reality. It makes me uncomfortable. And so, instead of truly seeing Lazarus, he blinded himself with distance and luxury. His story becomes, becomes completely self-oriented. And he had no room left for God. Well, the question for us today is, is this. What, what keeps us from seeing the world the way Jesus sees it? What keeps us from seeing the world the way Jesus sees it? Is it that we can't see like Jesus? Or is it that we don't want to? Because the truth is, if we see the world the way Jesus sees it, it might make us deeply uncomfortable. It might force us to change something about ourselves. Um, about seven years ago, I guess it was, again, while living in Alaska, uh, I was invited to join our church's high school youth group uh, on a mission trip to the city of Puerto Cavazos in Nicaragua. Uh, you may know that Nicaragua is the uh, second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere next to Haiti. And the town of Puerto Cavazos is on the eastern side of Nicaragua, which is the poor side of the, of the country. And for two weeks, our, our group lived and worked with a ministry that included a church and a school and an orphanage for a hundred children who either had no parents or actually more common whose parents couldn't afford to, to keep them. And I remember thinking before the trip, and I hate to admit this, but I remember thinking that perhaps I didn't want to go to Puerto Cabezas because I figured that if I did, I would be forced to acknowledge a reality that might make me uncomfortable, might upset my organized sense of how the world worked. After all, at that point, my, my life was pretty neatly organized. It, it, was, it, it was compartmentalized into ways that made sense and ways that frankly made me pretty comfortable. Well, as, you, as you'd guess, there was a whole lot about this experience that caused me and other people in our group to squirm, caused us to reevaluate how we understand the world. Uh, if you're on Facebook, there's this little feature that every year will show you memories from that time uh, several years ago. And so every, every year in the summer, uh, memories of this trip show up on my Facebook account, and, and many of those high school students who, who, who I remain in contact with, they're now in their early to mid-20s, they often post as to how formative uh, that trip was in their lives. But I remember 
one of the most profound situations was when we as a group were invited to visit the prison in town, the prison. And we got to the prison facility and our group was divided into three. Uh, the girls and the women in our group went to the women's prison. Uh, most of our guys went to the men's prison. But a small group of five guys, including me, uh, we went to a third area. It was the boys' youth cell. This cell is where they kept male prisoners under the age of 18. It was a, a single cell prison, perhaps about 15 by 15 feet, maybe the size of the average American master bedroom. And inside that space were about 15 teenage boys. We couldn't really see all the way to the back because it was a, a cinder block cell one gate, no lights, one little window, one little strip, daylight window strip. I wasn't allowed to take pictures. And as we approached the, the gate of this cell, I, I remember seeing arms stretching out through the bars of the gate, reaching for us, reaching for a cookie or a cup of soda, these little treats that we brought reaching for the connection of another human being. It had been a long time since they had received visitors. I was told that these boys were kept in their cell all the time. Perhaps every couple of weeks they would be uh, taken outside for an hour or so to do yard work. And I understood that each of these boys in their lives had been accused of heinous crimes. And I learned that they would most likely, each of them, be in prison for the rest of their lives. No lawyer was going to help them. Their families had mostly abandoned them. You see, in the world's eyes, they were animals. They were evil. They were beyond hope. And, and I remember, frankly, being tempted to repeat to myself, Matt, remember that they are criminals. Remember that they are criminals. Because I remember thinking, if only I can categorize them that way, understand them as criminals instead of teenage boys, then maybe I could live with the reality of what was before me. But then something happened that made it impossible to do this. Something happened that woke me up and caused me to see with new eyes. You see, our translator, a man named Milligan, he mentioned to the, to the boys in the cell, the prisoners, that that day was one of our young men's birthday. He had turned 17 that day. And when Milligan said that, from inside the cell, this little cell, came cheers and joy and laughter. A few arms reached out. They were extending to our, to our young guy these, these little bracelets that were made out of plastic grocery bags. And, and then they sang loudly in English, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And there were high fives and there were fist bumps and there were bro hugs through the gates. Not monsters at all, but boys who had become invisible. And for just a moment, heaven broke through and we saw them. And as we walked back to the bus, their voices still calling out to us. There were tears streaming down all of our faces because we saw these invisible boys the way God sees them. You know, a few times now we've talked about the difference between believing in Jesus and actually following Jesus. 
If we are simply people who believe in Jesus, then we can sort of nod and acknowledge that the world is broken, it needs fixing. We'll just acknowledge that and then sort of move on with our lives. But if we're actually going to follow Jesus, then we're going to have to open our eyes much wider. We're going to have to see the world as Jesus sees it. We're going to have to look at people like Lazarus and my friend Luke, those boys in Nicaragua, and here in our town of Millwood, the older widow today who lives down the street who hasn't left her house since the COVID pandemic began, the young girl in our town for whom school was the only safe haven from abusive parents that she knew, now trapped at home. We'll have to see a, a friend who is about to lose his business because of the economic collapse and the family of a man who died of the virus who didn't get to say goodbye and they can't even have a funeral. If we see the world the way God sees it, our hearts will be broken and we will be changed, but we'll be in good company because it's in those very places that we will find Jesus is already there. Amen.
Friends, I invite you to receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. We all say together, amen. Go in peace.